like what what we don't understand here in the Western world is the idea of blood sacrifice when that's done and what that does in attracting the kingdom of darkness, the unseen realm. Like stuff happens in an environment, in people, in surroundings when there's blood sacrifice done to fallen entities, to fallen demonic entities. All right, what's up, everybody? And welcome back to the Tattooed Preacher podcast. This is episode number 39. Hope you are all doing awesome today. So have you ever heard the story, famous biblical story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal? It's one of these stories that a lot of pastors, a lot of preachers love to talk about. I've grown up in church my whole life. I've even preached this myself, and I've heard this countless times, but it's only in the last couple years where I've really been exposed to the real supernatural worldview of the Bible that this story has become so much more alive to me, more significant, and why I think this story is one of the greatest examples of where God flexes his muscles, where he actually shows his superiority, his power, his control over not only the created order in, in terms of humanity, but over the unseen realm, over the kingdom of darkness. And so what I want to do is look at this story, but look at it from the kind of the behind the scenes perspective like what what was really going on and why this is such a powerful demonstration of God's power and so that's where we're going in this episode so if that interests you you're going to want to stick around but quickly as I typically do if you haven't yet followed me on Instagram TikTok you can follow me at the tattooed preacher YouTube subscribe to my channel um, same same handle. All the links to all my platforms and blah, 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 blah will be in the description below. And if you are listening to this on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please feel free to leave a comment, leave a review. That just helps me out tremendously. So yeah, Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Crazy story. Let's see how God flexes his muscles Enjoy the episode. Okay, so to set the stage here, as I mentioned, there is a supernatural worldview to the Bible that I think so many Christians, pastors, you know, religious leaders, they simply missed or don't know the full complexity of typically when you think of the spiritual world you think of the devil you think of jesus you think of angels and you think of demons and that's it when if you've been following me for any length of time you'll know that i'm continuously harping on the fact that the the unseen realm is so much more complicated and complex than we even realize it's it's so much more than just angels and demons there's the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of god is filled with so many more beings and the more you dive into the bible the more you dive into the context and to the historical background and 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 how the original hearers would have heard it and and, and what their worldview was like and all of that stuff you'll discover that even in the text, there's just so much more going on. And so when it comes to this story, man, I I think that when we read it with that lens, the, the real supernatural worldview behind it, when we read it through that lens, man, it's going to come 
so much more alive and really demonstrate and confirm to you how powerful, how awesome, how mighty our God is. And so to give some just context here to the story. So at this point, you have the king of Israel is Ahab, or the king of the northern kingdom is Ahab, and he's got this wicked wife named Queen Jezebel. And I think back in episode 36, 35, somewhere around there, I did a whole episode on Jezebel and the Jezebel spirit. But a quick recap, she was an extremely wicked woman. And she came from a neighboring nation, pagan nation, was raised in a home worshiping false gods, worshiping demonic entities from birth. And so this this girl, this lady, this woman would have been familiar with and raised in a whole bunch of satanic ceremonial rituals and and just man she would have been possessed i mean the levels of evil that she gets to you can't get there apart from being possessed and so this woman then becomes king ahab's wife as some kind of political alliance between israel the northern kingdom and this neighboring nation and ahab is a wimp And so she clings to Ahab and he becomes her puppet. And so she starts instituting a whole bunch of anti-God stuff in the northern kingdom of Israel. And so she goes after all the prophets of God, has them killed, has them hunted down. She then raises up her own army of the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah that she herself feeds and resources and promotes and pushes out and empowers. Um, she is involved in, in the pushing out of you know promiscuity and prostitution and this whole sexual perversion. And she pushes witchcraft and sorcery and all that stuff she interjects. She she instills in the northern kingdom of Israel. So this woman is evil and is just complete and utter bad news now as i just mentioned she was hunting down all the prophets and so at this point in the story elijah is the most you know famous the biggest prophet of the old testament and so he sees what's going on and he sees all his his comrades they're getting hunted down they're getting killed they're in hiding and all this kind of stuff But we get to this one scene here where Elijah, he's on the scene and he's looking at the people of the northern kingdom and he's seeing this evil agenda that's being pushed. And so he basically goes to the people. He's like, guys, you can't worship two gods here. You're either worshiping Yahweh or you're worshiping Baal or Asherah. Like You can't do both here. And so he puts the people to this test to decide, okay, who are you going to worship? And so then we get to this whole competition or this 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 showdown where through Jezebel and through Ahab and Elijah, they have this confrontation on top of Mount Carmel where you're going to have the prophets of Baal. There's 450 of them. And you're going to have two altars and so Elijah kind of makes the stipulations here and there's two altars they're taking this bull they're going to cut this bull up into pieces lay them on the altar and then each one the prophets of Baal and Elijah are going to call out to their God and whichever God strikes that altar with fire from heaven is the real God and so this is this is the setting this is what's leading up to um this massive showdown. So you have this evil worldview, this evil agenda that's being pushed, that's kind of culminated to this final battle between Elijah and these prophets and this dramatic showdown on Mount Carmel to see who actually is the real God. And so to start off, and we find this story in 1 Kings 18, and uh, beginning in verse, let's start in verse 20. So we're going to read 
and then I'll comment as we go along here. So it says, So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450. So Elijah's like, I'm the only one left here. Everyone's either hiding or they're dead from Jezebel. You all got 450. So let two bulls be given to us and let them choose one bull for themselves, cut into pieces, laid on the wood, but put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. And you will call upon the name of your God and I will call upon the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is the real God. That's the setup here. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. Then Elijah said to all the prophets of Baal, Choose for yourselves one bull, prepare it first, for you are many, and call upon the name of your God, but put no fire to it. So he lets them go first. And they took the bull that was given them, and they prepared it, and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, this is their prayer, right? O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice. And no one answered. And they limped around the altar that they had made. So here's the first part of this confrontation. So Elijah lets them go first. He's prophets of Baal, 450 of them. Now we have to understand here that Baal, Asherah, and there's a whole bunch of other gods that the nations worship. These weren't fictitious, fake gods that they just made up. We have to understand that in the supernatural worldview of the Bible, that these were actual fallen angels, fallen entities that rebelled against God. And so they weren't these, you know, fake, just statues, these idols that these people just randomly worshipped and, you know, hoped something would happen. Like these gods, small g gods, are actual fallen entities in the unseen realm. And when you look across all the different civilizations and nations, a lot of these entities are the same being just by different names. And so we have to understand that they were real. There are real demonic entities in the kingdom of darkness that these people worshipped. And so... Let's just think about that for a second. So you have Queen Jezebel, who was raised in a in a home where she was basically dedicated to these fallen entities, to these demonic entities. And so where I argue that where she was literally possessed by demonic spirits. And so when they're involved in a lot of these rituals and ceremonies and practices like stuff happened like there there is actual power in the kingdom of darkness like things actually happen so the occult witchcraft sorcery demonic ceremonies and rituals where blood sacrifice is happening like this stuff actually attracts demonic power demonic influence it's not fake And so it says that these 400 prophets of Baal, who, again, were instilled by Jezebel, this possessed demonic queen of the northern kingdom. It says that they called out, O Baal, answer us, but but there is no voice, and they limped around the altar. So that word limped there is this speaks of dancing. And so from, from morning until noon, they were dancing around the altar. So much so that they began to limp because they became so tired. But you have to understand, so like this, this whole setting, this whole scene where you have these two altars being set up and you cut up the bowl, you lay it on the altar, and then they start dancing around the altar. It's just, this is an actual ritualistic ceremony that they would conduct. This wasn't the first time they had done this. And they're going around and they're doing their chants and they're doing their special dances and and 
this stuff actually has power in the kingdom of darkness. When you start diving into witchcraft and sorcery and enchantments and all this stuff in the Bible, am I talking about modern day stuff? That's a whole other subject, but in the Bible, like these people actually had power in the kingdom of darkness, like stuff would happen. So this whole scenario, they didn't join this confrontation. They didn't just, you know, show up one day thinking that, oh, we serve a fake God. So, so let's, let's go after Elijah, the prophet of Yahweh into some, some confrontation, knowing that the God that we serve is fake and not real. Like that's not what they would do. They wouldn't walk into a fight knowing that they're going to lose. They're, they're engaging in ceremonial ritualistic activities in the worship of a false deity, a, a demonic entity that they would have already been done who knows how many times and who knows how many demonic experiences that they would have encountered. And so their first part of what they were doing is they were dancing around, chanting, doing whatever ceremonial activities that they did. That's what they were doing because it's worked before. This whole idea of getting fire to fall and to consume this altar was something that they would have experienced. And and if not specifically that, other events that would have led them to believe that they that their God, Baal, is the real God. And this is what we have to really understand. They weren't just wishfully thinking, oh, let's just do these random chants and dance around our altar looking like idiots to a fake God that doesn't even exist. Like That's not what was going on. And if you do a deep dive study into the worship of Baal and these practices and these ceremonies and stuff that they did, I mean, the stuff is demonic and it's intense and there's actual power there. But from morning until noon, that part, the dancing, the enchantments, their calling out was yielding no results. So this would have been sh- shocking to them. They would have been like, hey, what, like, what's going on here? And then we see at, at noon, Elijah starts mocking them saying, cry aloud for he is a god. Either he is musing himself or he's relieving himself. He's mocking these 450 prophets of Baal saying, hey, maybe your God's going to the bathroom. Now, for him to, to, to have that kind of attitude, I mean, he would have to know, Elijah would have had to know that God is doing something here. Because he's living in that worldview. He would have understood that there's, there's stuff going on in the unseen realm, that there is a kingdom of darkness. But he's mocking them as he's watching them for for hours doing their their ceremonies and their enchantments and all this stuff. And so like this is this is not just a simple jab. I mean, this this mock was like, man, like they would have these prophets of Baal would have been freaking out. Like what is going on? And now he's mocking. He's mocking our God. And then it says in verse 28, and then they cried aloud and they began to cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. So then they kind of take things to the next level and they start cutting themselves until blood was gushing out over them. And like this, this is satanic ritualistic practice 101. The cutting of skin and blood gushing out, blood sacrifice. Like what, what we don't understand here in the Western world is the idea of blood sacrifice when that's done and what that does in attracting the kingdom of darkness, the unseen realm. Like stuff happens in an environment, in people, in surroundings when there's blood sacrifice done to fallen entities, to fallen demonic entities. This wasn't just some, again, random thing that they decided to do because they were all out of options. Let's just cut ourselves. Like when you, when you 
research just that act in and of itself all throughout history, even up till today. The act of cutting yourself, blood gushing out, the role that blood has in ceremonies and rituals is is so far beyond the, the, the modern Western perspective. It does something in the unseen realm. It unlocks things. It opens things up to where the unseen realm can interact with our world. This is why they do these things. When you study satanic rituals and ceremonies, it's always involving blood, sacrificing of animals, sacrificing of people. Whenever blood is being spilt and shed and along with certain enchantments and sayings and prayers and all this kind of stuff, it it literally unlocks things in the supernatural. It's not just random exercise. Stuff happens. It attracts the power of powers of darkness. It creates openings for them to come into our terrestrial space and influence humanity. This is why they do those things. Because in the unseen realm, the way God is uh, the way God has orchestrated things and structured things, demonic entities and, and beings in the unseen realm can't just do whatever they want. There's still structure and policy and and format that has to take place. They can't just interact with us on a whim and like, like and do whatever they want. There 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 has there's rules in place that allow them to cross bounds and to come into our space and this kind of stuff certain enchantments and ceremonies and rituals with blood and all this stuff is part of part of the way that gives them access into our realm and so this is what these people were doing this wasn't random and so they're calling out to their god Baal and they're dancing around and they're doing their stuff for hours nothing's happening then they start cutting themselves blood's being gushed blood's being spilt they're continuously dancing around now because this is the stuff that they would have done before that's attracted results except this time nothing is happening like the level of evil and satanic activity here is huge this is and these were 450 prophets of this false god. They weren't just random people. They were prophets. This was their job. This is what they did. This is what they devoted their lives to. Giving them themselves over. I mean, there's it's very possible that each one of these guys were literally possessed as well. And so when you put all of that together, and so for hours they're calling out to their god, they're they're doing their ceremonies, they're doing their rituals, they're cutting themselves. Blood is being spilt and yet Nothing happens. Nothing happens. To me, this highlights and signifies and just shows the level of power that God has. Because there's all throughout history, I mean, these fallen, these fallen beings have influenced nations. These fallen entities um, have created systems and certain civilizations and all that stuff where they influence people and they get access to come into our world through you know these various means. But on this particular day, God said no. Like he shuts it down. No matter what they did, no matter what they tried, nothing worked. And unfortunately, like in typical... On a typical Sunday morning, if a pastor is preaching on this, that whole part doesn't ever really get fully specified and unpacked. It's always, well, they you know they cried out to Baal and nothing happened. You know, they're just an idol, and you know, basically God said no. Like it, it they don't unpack the fact that typically stuff would have happened. Typically, the kingdom of darkness has power and when they're given access through various ceremonies and rituals and practices and all that stuff that gives them access to to do stuff to unleash 
supernatural power and influence into our world. It didn't happen. And so God literally on this moment, in this massive battle, he flexes and he's like, nope, not today. And he shuts it down. And so these 450 prophets of Baal, they, like they would have been stunned, covered in blood, tired, exhausted, done everything that they know how to do <laughs> to worship their God, to create a opening for him to come in and cause fire to hit their altar. Nothing happened. And then you have Elijah standing back, mocking them, saying, well, maybe you're Maybe your God's just going to the bathroom. You know, maybe, you know, maybe he's sleeping. And for hours, nothing happened. So then you have Elijah. And Elijah's like, okay, my turn. And Elijah goes and he asks people to bring water. And I think this was in the middle of a famine. So water was, you know, very scarce. But he gets people to go bring water. And he douses the altar that he built with water. So not only just the animal, the bull on the wood, but he soaks it in water, which is the opposite thing of what you would do if you want to set something on fire. You don't douse the wood with water. But he does that. And then he calls out to Yahweh. And then Yahweh literally from heaven sends fire and it consumes the altar. And it's like, like you, like you have to just see that moment there, where heaven opens up, and like I would love to know what that would have looked like, to have fire come from heaven. Like, like what does does a portal open up in the sky into that realm, and and fire shoots out? Like, like was it a some kind of a meteor or a comet from the sky flying? That like, I would love to know what that looked like. But whatever it was, fire came, consumes it, and everyone is left just stunned. The prophets of Baal, the people that were there watching, and it's like there is no mistake now, no mistake who the real God is, which God is the most powerful, who has all control, who has all authority. This is where Yahweh flexes his muscles like in few places that he does. He flexes his muscles and he's like, I'm the top dog here. All you other lower G gods, if I want to silence you, I'm going to silence you. If I want to shut you down, I'm going to shut you down. I don't care what you do. I don't care what ceremonies. I don't care what rituals. I don't, I don't care what demonic practices you do. At the end of the day, if I want to shut you down, I'm going to shut you down. And God did. He flexed. And so I see this story and I'm just like, it, 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 it. having that backdrop now just makes it come so much more alive to me. And it brings me a lot of hope for today. Because yeah, that's a cool story that, that happened back then and God flexed back then and that's awesome. But like, how do we take this and, and, and bring the truth of that into our modern day context? And so I've been doing, you know, a lot of research and study into the occult and witchcraft and all that stuff in our modern day today. And you look around and you just, you see Hollywood, you see the elites of society, you see all the, the, the nastiness that is becoming made known, becoming public of what of what happens to the with the elites of society behind the scenes all this garbage all this nonsense all this demonic stuff that's happening and it's like i see this story and and it gives me faith fresh faith a renewed faith to look at this stuff and go god's still bigger at the end of the day it does not matter how powerful a demonic entity is how evil, how possessed someone is. It doesn't matter how much they've given themselves over to the kingdom of darkness. It does not matter how thick a specific atmosphere is over a region uh, that's pure, just demonically influenced. It, 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 it doesn't matter because no matter, God is still above it. 
God can still shut it down. And so I look at that and I'm just like, how do we take this 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 story and and multiply it in our world today to where men and women of God, Christians, you know, are not afraid to step up for God and to display his ultimate power and authority in our world. Like I look at that and I'm just like this could just man this would be such a crazy witness especially in our day today because there's so much junk that's out there and it's like you have so many people that are that doubt the existence of God and 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 it's like you have this scene happen with a modern context and you have social media in the age that we live in i mean this would just just um, like i i just it, it makes me it makes me so excited at the potential and the possibilities of what could happen if men and women of god had the faith had the understanding had the the courage the discernment to allow god to use them like he used elijah not calling everyone prophets. It's not about being a prophet. This is about being a man or woman of God that allows God to use them in a way to destroy the kingdom of darkness for Jesus. To allow the power of God to flow through you like Elijah to destroy the kingdom of darkness. Like that, that's the point here that excites me and that I feel passionate about. Because the more you look around, the more evil and stuff that you that I see in our world, and it's like it's 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 getting to a point where it's oftentimes it's a lot easier talking about and seeing the kingdom of darkness and all that stuff because it seems to me like it's more powerful and more influencing than the kingdom of God, and it should be the other way around and so my heart, my desire is to see that men and women would rise up. And that we would see the spread and the unleashing of the kingdom of God in every sphere of society and culture. And that we would just see the, the power of God displayed and that we would see God flex his muscles today like he did back then. Like he did on this confrontation on Mount Carmel where literal demonic entities, fallen angels, fallen sons of God were being worshipped. And there's 450 prophets who were most likely possessed. That they were resourced by a possessed queen. That they would have seen and experienced stuff. And that on that particular day, God shuts it all down. And that we would be people today that we would see, man, God shutting things down again. So yeah, that's it. That's, that's kind of what I wanted to share on this story. Um, I hope that, you know, when you read this, that, that that backdrop is in the back of your mind, that you can see the actual power and the, and, and the magnitude and the significance that's there. Um, and that it doesn't matter how dark things may seem or how dark things get. I mean, God is God. He's creator. He's king of kings and lord of lords. He's, he's a ruler. And at any moment, he can shut things down. It does not matter how powerful or how evil or how wicked or how whatever a demonic entity or a demonic reality may be. God is God and he's over it all and he's more powerful than it all. And so, yeah, I pray that 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 reality hits you every time you read that story now. And so, yeah, thanks so much for listening and or watching to episode 39 of the Tattoo Preacher podcast. Feel free to leave any comments, questions below. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you learned anything. Let me know if you disagree or maybe you let me know if you if there's anything that you want to add to what I said. Um, yeah, it's a powerful story. So much there. So yeah, feel free to leave comments, questions below and we'll see you all in the next episode. Much love. God bless.